Okay, well, the webinar of today, Introduction to Muscle Measurements. What will the content be of this presentation? So first, a bit of theoretical background on near-infrared spectroscopy itself, the physics, but also some examples from uh, some data sets that we acquired at Artinas ourselves. And then some quantitative measurements uh, around for a few questions. Then we're going to look at the devices that we at Artinas have some literature and then a demonstration and multi-channel measurement uh, performed by myself on myself. As we cannot do that on site, of course, in, uh, in these Corona times. So as Renata already said, the company Artinas started in 2002, but it was approximately 200 years before that, that Frederick William Herschel discovered light beyond the visible spectrum. So using a prism glass and a thermometer, I found that there was a warmer temperature what was this uh, this well thing that he discovered then this was infrared light so as the name nears near infrared light already suggests we use light in this region near infrared you can say that as human humans we're actually a bit limited we can only see 400 up to 700 nanometers as you can see here whereas the whole spectrum goes from the nuclear nuclear waves all the way to this long radio waves here the infrared region is just above this visible spectrum. It's, it's around 800 up to 1000 nanometers. And why do we use this light then? Well, that's actually because of two principles. Uh, the first one is something that I'm going to show you right now. As you can see, light surpasses the tissue, especially infrared light surpasses the tissue. You can also see that in these images is not something that's new. They actually knew that way back already, as you can see from this old painting. The other principle can be displayed by this graph. Here we again see the wavelengths, this time from 650 up to 1000 nanometers. And on the y-axis, we see the absorption coefficient. We're going to have a look at two chromophores in our tissue. We're going to look at deoxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. And what's well, interesting about these two chromophores is that they cross in the middle of this graph. So for our systems, we use two wavelengths, a wavelength 760 and a wavelength 850. 760 because we can see that the chromophore deoxyhemoglobin is the main absorber and the wavelength 850 because oxyhemoglobin is the main absorber. Below 700 nanometers, biological tissue is actually the main absorber and above 900 roughly uh, nanometers, you can see that water will be the main absorber. But what's most important from this graph is that we use the two wavelengths to quantify oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. Then, of course, if we well, transmit light onto our tissue, it's not only absorbed. A part of the light is also reflected. A part then, of course, is absorbed. A part is scattered away and a part is transmitted, so it surpasses the tissue. In NIRS, we can quantify the outgoing light here, sorry, the incoming light, so the light that's fired from our transmitter and the outgoing light, which is received on the receiving end. If we put that in a nice formula, we can quantify the absorbance, uh, which equals the incoming light divided by the outgoing light. Transmission then equals the outgoing light divided by the incoming light. To give you a bit of well, background on that, if we have a fully transparent tissue, so a case scenario, of course, we see that all the light surpasses the tissue, thus we have a transmission of 100%. If we have a fully opaque tissue, it's, it's completely black, as you can see here, there will be a transmission of 0%, since none of the light will be received on the receiving end. Since biological tissue is neither opaque or transparent, a certain amount is absorbed by the chromophores in our tissue, we need to include a base. So the formula then will become optical density or absorbance, we use these terms simultaneously actually, equal the base 10 of the incoming light divided by the outgoing light. This is the first half of our formula that we use for near-infrared spectroscopy. Together with the statements from Beer and Lambert, Beer stated the absorbance depends on the concentration. Well, as we can see here, if we have a higher concentration, more of the light will be absorbed, and thus the absorbance will rise. Absorbance equals molecular extinction coefficient times concentration. And together with Lambert, who stated, well, the absorbance is also dependent on the length in a formula that looks like this. So the absorbance equals molecular extinction coefficient times length. We can, well, uh, add all these formulas into one big formula and we get to the law known as the Beer-Lambert law. 
So the absorbance equals base 10 of the incoming light divided by the outgoing light equals molecular extinction coefficient times concentration times length. So far the physics part of this presentation. In NIRS we used this formula but we slightly adapted it. We used the modified pierre lambert law. So what did we modify then? We included a delta, so we're measuring changes. We included a DPF. What is the DPF? The DPF stands for differential path length factor. So we have a transmitter, we have a receiver, and in theory it's this nice thin line of light, but in practice it's actually more of a well, banana shape, it's more a bulb of light. There's scattering happening over here, there's scattering happening over there, scattering happening well, all over the course of the trace. And to correct for these light losses due to the scattering, we included the DPF. Typically used in muscle research, the DPF is set to four. But what's most important is that it is a constant factor. The molecular extinction coefficient is a constant as well, so a constant for oxyhemoglobin and a constant for deoxyhemoglobin. The length that we're measuring over is a constant as well. DPF was a constant, so therefore we know that a change in optical density or a change in light that we're measuring actually equals a change in concentration. If we put that in a scheme, so with NIRS we measure light attenuation, and based on the hemoglo oh, sorry, based on the modified lambert beer law or beer lambert law, we can then quantify changes in oxyhemoglobin and changes in deoxyhemoglobin. If we add these two parameters, we of course get a total hemoglobin as well. Note that these are changes, which means it's a change relative to a baseline. Also noteworthy is the fact that we cannot distinguish between hemoglobin and myoglobin. So myoglobin takes approximately five to 10% of your signal, but uh, when you're exercising, your changes will happen in hemoglobin and your myoglobin will stay stable throughout the exercise. For the wavelength 850, we can quantify oxyhemoglobin. For the wavelength 760, we can quantify deoxyhemoglobin. Uh, for some of our modalities, we can add an extra wavelength. And we can optionally measure other chromophores as well, for example, cytochrome oxidase. Besides the relative changes in oxy and deoxy values, we can also quantify an absolute value. This is what we refer to as the TSI, the Tissue Saturation Index. It's based on spatial resolved spectroscopy and we use the slope of the distance versus the optical density. So we need multiple transmitters measuring roughly the same location, they fire onto this receiver, and then based on the diffusion approximation by Patterson et al, we can derive a percentage of oxygen in the tissue. If we look at the formula, so tissue saturation index equals oxyhemoglobin over the total hemoglobin times 100%, total hemoglobin being deoxyhemoglobin plus oxyhemoglobin. This is an absolute value. Sounds a bit abstract maybe, an uh, absolute value which is a percentage, but it's uh, well, what it is actually. So uh, it's a percentage of oxygen in the tissue. If we include this in the scheme as well, oxygen saturation based on spatial resolved spectroscopy, TSI, the tissue saturation index. As said, in theory, we have this nice thin line going from transmitter to the receiver, but in practice, it's more on, well, a banana shape, an area that we're measuring. So we're measuring the capillaries over here. Uh, we're not measuring the arteries, we're not measuring the veins. In pulse oximetry, for example, you measure these, so you measure the inflow or the, um, yeah, so the inflow that you're measuring with pulse oximetry, we're not measuring that, we're truly measuring the tissue, the capillaries. Uh, for well, most of our modalities, the distance between the transmitter and the receiver is 30 millimeters, and as a rule of thumb, we say, well, we measure at approximately half the inter-opto distance, so we're measuring at 1.5 uh, centimeters deep. Of course, we're not only measuring this part, we're also measuring the changes happening on this part of the trace and also on this part of the trace. So there is an effect of the adipose tissue layer uh, or skull layer if you're measuring on cerebral tissue. To give you an idea of the magnitude of that effect, if we have an adipose tissue thickness of nine millimeters, you'll measure 49% of muscle Whereas with a way thinner adipose tissue thickness of 1.4 millimeters, you'll measure 92% of muscle. 
So this is an image from uh, Kui and colleagues, which they already created in 1991. But as of now, there is actually no perfect way to correct for this. What we at Artinis recommend is if you have two groups, a control group and an intervention group, make sure that the adipose tissue thickness in between these two groups is roughly similar. There's research groups using Monte Carlo models to correct for the adipose tissue thickness. There's other research groups using physiological calibrations. But what we suggest is just to make sure that the adipose tissue thickness in between your two groups is similar. So now we're going to look at an example. What does the data that we collect look like? This is the multi-stage fitness test measured on the fastus lateralis muscle. So what is the multi-stage fitness test? Uh, well, most of you have probably done it a way back. For me, it was a few years back actually since I just graduated, but um, it's the beep test. So uh, we start at eight and a half kilometers per hour and every minute the speed will increase by 0.5 kilometers per hour. So we start with five minutes of warming up. As start of the test is eight and a half kilometers per hour and every minute an event is placed resembling the increase in speed. We ran on a treadmill, so in uh, comparison for the beep test, you will, run, you will, well, you will be shuttling between uh, well, the gymnastics hall, probably, but this test was performed on a treadmill to keep it a bit more standardized. In red, we see changes in oxyhemoglobin. In blue, we see changes in deoxyhemoglobin. Green is the total hemoglobin level, and black is actually HB diff, which is a new parameter. That's the difference between oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. X-axis is, of course, time, and uh, on the y-axis, we see the changes in micromotors. Now, if we look at the trend of this graph, so we know that the speed increases, we can actually see that the changes are relatively stable throughout the beginning of the test. So up to 13, 13 and a half kilometers per hour, we see that the supply and demand in the muscle that we're measuring, the fastus lateralis, is stable. After 13 and a half kilometers per hour, you'll actually see a decrease in oxyhemoglobin and an increase, uh, sorry, a decrease in oxyhemoglobin and an increase in deoxyhemoglobin. What does this mean? It simply means that the muscle cannot keep up anymore. So there is a decrease in oxygen in the tissue. What could the reason be? Well, it can either be the heart, which is not pumping hard enough, but it can also be the mitochondria, who cannot change the oxy into deoxy fast enough. Another threshold can be well, roughly distinguished at 19 kilometers per hour, where there's, a, where there's another decrease in oxy and an increase in deoxyhemoglobin. If we zoom in onto a specific section during the warm up, you can actually see the changes in oxy and deoxy happening in real time as well. These correspond to the flexion and extension of the muscle. Then the TSI, which was the absolute measure, so it's roughly 70% in rest. Then at the start of the test, we see an initial dip, stable throughout the beginning, but then the demand of the muscle surpasses the supply, so you see a decrease in oxygen in the tissue. Some quantitative measurements. So normally this is where the fun for me starts. I'm going to be asking questions to the crowd, but there's not that much interaction possible on Zoom. So uh, I'll just talk us through what's happening during a venous occlusion. A venous occlusion, let's say we're measuring on the, on the lower arm here and we're placing a cuff on the upper arm. We will inflate the cuff up to a certain level where our veins are occluded, but our arteries are not. The arteries uh, make sure that there's inflow, the veins make sure that there's outflow. Venous occlusion just means that there still is inflow, but there's no outflow anymore. What do we expect that will happen to the total hemoglobin level, oxyhemoglobin level, and deoxyhemoglobin level? Uh, well, I'm going to talk us through it, of course, as I already promised. <laughs> the muscle is in rest, so there is enough oxyhemoglobin supplied. We will not see a decrease in oxyhemoglobin since there is a surplus supplied to the muscle. Deoxyhemoglobin is not supplied, but is used by the muscle. The muscle is still consuming oxygen, so the derivative is, of course, deoxyhemoglobin. We will also see an increase in deoxyhemoglobin. It cannot go away since the veins are occluded, meaning everything will rise. Oxy rises, deoxy rises. Well, if we add these two parameters, we get a total hemoglobin level, which will rise as well. This is what that will look like. We see during the venous occlusion, an increase in deoxyhemoglobin, an increase in oxyhemoglobin, and an increase in total hemoglobin. 
probably could have guessed the next slide already, the arterial occlusion, which means that there is no inflow and no outflow anymore. What do we expect to see in our traces? Just taking a bit of water, let you guys think, hopefully shout to the computer maybe. So during the arterial occlusion, we know there's no inflow and no outflow. Total hemoglobin level should stay relatively flat if we do a perfect occlusion. Our muscle is still consuming oxygen, but there is no oxyhemoglobin supplied, so there will be a decrease in oxyhemoglobin. As a result, as well, an increase in deoxyhemoglobin, since the muscle is still using oxyhemoglobin, transferring it into deoxyhemoglobin, basically. So this is what that graph will look like. During the arterial occlusion, a relatively stable total hemoglobin level, decrease in oxyhemoglobin, increase in deoxyhemoglobin. Once the cuff is released, reoxygenation. Then the TSI, which was the percentage of oxygen in the tissue, relatively stable at approximately 70-75%. Then once the cuff is inflated, decrease in oxygen in the tissue once the cuff is released, reoxygenation. <clears throat> what can we do based on these, well, occlusions? We can quantify the oxygen consumption, for example. How can we do that? Well, I'll start with the arterial occlusion. We know there's nothing supplied, so the decrease in oxyhemoglobin is simply due to the fact that the muscle consumes the oxygen. If we use the slope, we get a value as uh, well, micromolars of change per second. If we want to have an absolute value, there's a formula for that as well. During this introduction, we're not going to dive into the formula, but note that you have to do parameters such as time and standard pressure, for example. Then you can derive a value in milliliters of oxygen per minute per 100 grams. During the venous occlusion, you can also quantify the oxygen consumption. Then it's actually the increase in deoxyhemoglobin, since deoxyhemoglobin is the derivative of the oxygen consumption. Besides oxygen consumption, another interesting parameter is the blood flow. During the venous occlusion, we know that there's inflow, but no outflow. So we know that the increase in total hemoglobin equals the blood flow. Other interesting things are, for example, the reoxygenation rate or the half recovery time, all interesting things that you can quantify based on occlusion. So what devices does Artinas have to measure specifically on muscle tissue? We have four modalities, actually. We have the Oximon system, which is a laser-based system, and then we have the Portalite, the Portamon, and the Optimon, which are all lead-based systems. Um, well, the Oximon is the first system that we at Artinis created. It's a well cabinet, as you can see here, and it works with optical fibers. So there's transmitting fibers and receiving fibers. As you can already see from this image, uh, it has some disadvantages. It's a stationary system. You work with fibers, which uh, sorry, you work with fibers, which in an exercising environment can be a bit difficult. But the laser-based system does have several benefits as well. One of the benefits is that you can have a greater penetration depth. So what I just showed was a diff well opto sorry inter opto distance of 30 millimeters, but with the oxymon you can actually well have way broader distances up to five six centimeters even meaning that you have a penetration depth of roughly two and a half, three centimeters. In the case of a thicker adipose tissue thickness, this might become interesting. Also, it's very customizable and versatile, meaning that you can create, well, especially interesting in FNIR studies, so functional brain monitoring up to 112 channels even. One of the other systems is the Portamon, which is a wearable system. Uh, as you can see here, this one is bound to the laboratory. The Portamon is a system that you can also bring out. You can do offline measurement and online measurement. Online meaning that it connects via Bluetooth to a PC. Offline meaning that you can go for a run through the park and download the data afterwards. Besides the changes in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, you can also quantify TSI, which was the tissue saturation index. Um, Battery life is eight hours, so you can go for a marathon even, come back, download the data afterwards, analyze where you can have a better performance. Then the Porta Light system. This is similar to the Portamon, also three transmitters firing to one receiver, but this one has a flexible probe, which makes it, well, easier to measure rounder muscles. In this case, for example, you can measure this rounder area here, which is not possible with a Portamon since it has a flat surface. 
Uh, besides muscle tissue, you can also measure the prefrontal cortex actually with this system since it fits the prefrontal well, area here, slightly curved, perfectly fine as well. Has a higher sample frequency in comparison to the portable as well, 50 hertz. Is this a great benefit? Normally changes in oxygen dioxy as well as DSI do not happen very fast, so 50 hertz or 10 hertz does not really matter. One of the later systems is the Octomal muscle, as the name already suggests, Octa, it has eight channels, but not on the same location. So we have uh, two times four channels actually in a square firing to one receiver in the middle. So we have different regions. You can actually quantify the regional differences in oxygenation. And this is something that we're going to have a look at during the demo as well. It has an adjustable inter opdote distance from two to four centimeters. So uh, if you're interested in the superficial uh, layers or a bit deeper, you can play around a bit with the system. Yeah, then we're going to have a look at some literature. So uh, Artina's equipment has been used a lot. Luckily for us, we have uh, hypoxia studies on well the higher end of the spectrum, but also on a very deep level. This is just a representation of a classic exercise physiology integrated with spirometry in this case. And this one is more from an FNIRS perspective, uh, full brain monitoring in uh, combination with virtual reality. So some examples from literature. Last year, in 2019, there were 256 publications with the NIRS systems, 86 of those were with the Oximal system, 83 of those were with the Portimal system, mainly, read, uh, mainly situated in neurology, so functional brain monitoring, rehabilitation, neuromarketing, neurology, etc but also still a lot of papers in sports science, measuring muscle tissue or peripheral tissue. So the main regions are sports medicine and science then of course, but also elite sports training and some projects in ergonomics. Besides the classic neurology and sports science regions, we also have some more abstract regions such as urology or neonatal imaging, breast imaging, a whole lot of um, applications. Then, what does a classic exercise physiology paper look like? So this is a paper by Martin Bucheit and Pierre Oefland from 2011, and the title is Effect of Endurance Training on Performance and Muscle Reoxygenation Rate During Repeated Sprint Running. So they analyzed the effect of uh, eight weeks of endurance training on repeated sprints. Let's have a look at this graph. So on the y-axis, we see time. And for this first thing that I'm going to talk us through, we see performance, so the sprint distance in meters. They sprinted for 15 seconds and we see a performance of 70 meters. Then they had 15 seconds of rest and they had to do a shuttle sprint again. Performance for the second sprint was a bit less, but still good of course, 65 meters. Then the subjects were subdued to eight weeks of endurance training and they repeated the test. Again, 15 seconds of sprinting, so performance around 70 meters. The second sprint was actually significantly better after the training program. Not that much uh, of a, a drop in performance. So again, 69, 70 meters. And um, how is this possible? Well, they had a look at the TSI value, so the tissue saturation index in the vastus lateralis muscle. Um, they placed the system, saw in rest roughly 78% of oxygen in the tissue drop in oxygen during the first sprint, recovery during the rest period, and then a drop in oxygen during the second sprint again. But after the training program, they actually saw less drop and a better recovery. There's a better reoxygenation during the rest period, leading to a higher starting point in TSI during the second sprint. And there's a bigger amplitude in TSI during the second sprint. If we normalize these values, so we say that the start of the test 78% is, sorry, 78% DSI is 100. The lowest point here is zero. We can actually see way better that the recovery truly makes the difference here. So we see the recovery before the test and recovery after the training program. <clears throat> Increased distance slash speed during the second sprint. And that was due to the fact that it was a higher DSI before the second sprint and there's a better recovery. Another paper that we're going to have a look like, uh, sorry, have a, a look at is actually by <laughs> one of the uh, professors who already asked the question, Chris Cooper. He will also be presenting the 24th of June, another webinar in the webinar series that we have. But um, 
He and his colleagues had a look at the asymmetry differences during uh, short track skating. So they placed the system on the quadricep muscle, let the short track skaters go for a few laps, and then look, uh, had a look at the asymmetry differences. So why would we expect asymmetry during short track, during short track skating? Well, that's due to the fact that there is way more pressure on the inner leg. The left leg is uh, well, way more pressurized in comparison to the right leg, which is, well, to put it in its own words, actually dangling around the corners. If we look at this graph showing the time in seconds on the x-axis and the change in TSI on the y-axis, we can see that the right leg is relatively stable and there's a significant difference and change in comparison to the right leg or the left leg. When this information was passed to the coaches, the coaches said that they were going to focus more on the left leg and do asymmetry strength performance training. But uh, I'm not sure if that really happened. Maybe Chris Cooper uh, can elaborate on that during the Q&A session. Then if you're interested in this type of literature, we actually have a literature list on our website. You can have a look at that. All the publications with all our devices, not only for muscle tissue, but also for cerebral tissue can be retrieved from there. Now for the hands-on part, we normally really, well, promote this and like you guys to play around with the systems as well, but for now it will <laughs> be me playing around with the system. So uh, what are we going to do? We're going to do a multiple channel measurement. Why is that interesting? Well, one of the great benefits of NIRS is that you're measuring locally. For example, we place a system here on the rectus femoris. We're truly measuring what's happening on this part of the muscle in comparison to spirometry where you measure the distribution of your whole system. It's very interesting. But can we actually say that the muscle is homogeneous? So is the change in this part of the muscle the same as over here? We know there is heterogeneous activation, uh, sorry, activity, activation during activity. For example, in this case, the quadricep muscle, which consists of four parts. We know that the middle part, the rectus femoris, is a B-articular muscle, meaning that it controls hip flexion as well as knee extension. The other part of this muscle, the vastus lateralis, is the same muscle, but is only a single articular muscle, meaning that it only controls the knee extension. Could there be oxygenation differences going hand in hand with that? Well, it's, it's actually way further than that. It's not only the different activation that occurs and therefore the different oxygenation, but there's regional differences in oxygenation as well. This is something that has been proved already by the Quaristimayal and his colleagues. They had a look at the non-uniform quadricep oxygen consumption revealed by near-infrared multipoint measurements. So they placed an oximal system actually over the quadricep muscle and did an occlusion for two minutes. They measured 12 sites in an area of approximately eight by eight centimeters. The first five optodes were placed on the rectus femoris, the lower seven placed on the vastus lateralis. And if we look at this graph, we can see the typical traces, as we already discussed during the quantitative measurements, we see a decrease in oxyhemoglobin, an increase in deoxyhemoglobin, total hemoglobin staying relatively flat, but the magnitude on these different locations actually differs. We have the same y-axis for all graphs here. And as you can see, magnitudes in between the same muscle differs. So therefore we can say that there's oxidative metabolic heterogeneity within, well, in this case, the quadricep muscle. For demo purposes, I'm not going to strip my clothes down, but I'll be doing the occlusion on my lower arm. So um, what I'll be doing is I'll be using the octamon system, placing a cuff on my upper arm and doing a two minute occlusion. So as uh, stated on this slide here, we have two times four sites. So this is what an optimum system looks like. We have a receiver, four transmitters covering an area of approximately five by five centimeters. I'll be placing it over here and over here. And that's something that I am going to do right now. So now I'll be switching to OxySoft. This is what OxySoft looks like. We have a workspace on this side. We have a project and the measurements that we did on the left side and on the upper part, there is a toolbar with a whole lot of options. So I just placed the battery in the system. It's turning on right now. And let's see if we can start a measurement. So create measurement and start device. Well, name giving is one of the <laughs> pitfalls in research. So I'll include a date for now, 206.10. 
optimal muscle test. Uh, let's see where the mouse is. We're not doing a 24 channel measurements, but I don't want to have a predefined template. Next, so now we're going to add the system. I'm going to connect it via Bluetooth. So there is a USB dongle in my PC. Oxymon, Portamon, Portalite, or Octamon. We're connecting the Octamon. So this is the system idea that we're going to connect. And let's see if it works. Maybe the second time it does. Nice. So now the blue Bluetooth light is blinking, meaning that there is a connection between the system and the PC. The template that we're going to use two times four channels, DPF set to four for this demo. So the D, which we also discussed, is the distance between the transmitter and the receiver for this system. Now it's placed at 35 millimeters. Next, these are all the wavelengths corresponding to every individual transmitter. Next, we're sampling at 10 Hertz. And we want to start measuring after we finish this wizard. So the last thing that it requests is what graphs do we want to see? We want to see single graphs for oxyhemoglobin, single graphs for deoxyhemoglobin, single graphs for total hemoglobin. Okay, and well, do we want to enable the light sources to start firing? Yes, we want that. And if all went well, you'll see that the light sources are firing right now. Let's see, yes, we have a signal coming in. Well, these are the eight channels that we're measuring. This is the template DAQ state, where we can see the status of the device, and this is still our measurement. We can see we've been measuring for 15 seconds. We can see that the system is okay, battery is 100%. I charged a bit for this demo. And we can also see that the channels are actually marked red, which means we have a bad signal from transmitter one to receiver one, simply due to the fact that I did not place the system yet. So I'm going to place the system right now. Let's see if we can do this a bit convenient. So of course you'll see a lot of artifacts in the software now. That's simply because I'm placing the system. Okay. If all went well, the system should be in place right now. So it's placed on my lower arm. We have a good signal for most of the channels, as you can see here. So I'll close this one for now. Make sure that the graphs are opened in full size. And now we're still seeing changes in oxyhemoglobin in red, changes in deoxyhemoglobin in blue, changes in total hemoglobin in green. But on a very noisy scale, what we want to do is we want to reset our baseline. So I'm going to do that right now by clicking the not clear graphs, freeze graphs. This one, which is a smart key F6. Now we're seeing the changes in oxy and deoxy relative to the point where I reset my traces. First, we wanna take well a few seconds of resting. So I'm going to place an event R, which resembles rest. And we know this is a resting state. So I just set R, I can even add the comment rest. Okay, this is not visible right now, but it will be afterwards. Another toy that I brought is actually the calf. So I'm going to place the calf right now because it's a bit easier to do the muscle with a calf than to do it myself, actually. This is the part I was not looking forward to, placing this calf myself. But here we go, it's placed. So we have a bit of noise just to reset my baseline again. There we go place the event R, this will be noted as R2 rest. Okay, just take a few seconds of rest before we truly start the occlusion actually. We can see the time since our event R, we're going to do a two minute occlusion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to inflate the cuff up to a very high pressure, which I know is higher than my uh, systolic blood pressure, meaning that both arteries and veins are occluded. I'll place the event S to resemble start of the occlusion. S, okay, now I'm going to inflate the cuff. Now what we expect to see 
is a decrease in oxyhemoglobin and an increase in deoxyhemoglobin. Did not really have the proper baseline for all of my channels, but that's something that we can correct afterwards, luckily for us as well. But as you can already see for most of the channels is a decrease in deoxyhemoglobin and an increase in oxyhemoglobin. Whilst the total hemoglobin, the green line is staying relatively flat. I can still feel a bit of, well, pulsation actually in my arm, meaning that it's not a perfect occlusion. Pump it up a bit higher maybe, there we go. So it's been 50 seconds since start of the occlusion. We're going to do it for two minutes. Now I have to fill in one other minute, just taking a bit of water here. Okay, everything is still behaving as it should. Oxyhemoglobin is going down, deoxy is going up. Right, so after two minutes, I will place another event marking the release of the cut. Well, I already used the event R for uh, rest, event S for start of the test. So I'll do an O for, or an E for end of occlusion maybe. It's more, uh, makes more sense. What we expect to see once the cut is released, we expect to see a very steep increase in oxyhemoglobin since that's the reoxygenation. We also expect the increase in total hemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin to shoot down. So it's been two minutes since I started inflating. I'll place an E and I'll relieve, uh, release the cup. So end of the test, cup is released. And as promised, reoxygenation happening in our traces. So now we're going to let it reset a bit, going back to baseline, and then we're going to have a look at what we actually measured. And maybe more interesting for us, what can we do with these measurements? Can we truly see regional differences, even for such a relative simple and short test slash task? Just letting it reset a bit more, 20 seconds. So initial very steep reoxygenation for oxyhemoglobin, but as you can see, it's already decreasing a bit again. I think one minute is okay. I'll place event F for finish. There we go. And I'm going to stop this measurement. So not stop zoom completely. It will be a bit sad. Whoop. There we go. Yes. So this is the measurement that we just collected. A lot of noise in the beginning, then the events R1, R2, marking the rest period, start of the occlusion, end of the occlusion, finish. We're interested in this section. So there we go. As we can see, still a bit noisy. But what I'm going to do right now is set this event S as the zero point of our measurement. So let's say set all traces in measurement to zero. So now the changes in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin are seen relative to the start of the occlusion. We can scale it a bit better. And as you can see, there still is a well, slight increase in total hemoglobin uh, corresponding to the increase in uh, blood flow. So it wasn't a perfect occlusion. We still see a bit of an increase in oxy, uh, sorry, total hemoglobin. But we do clearly see the difference between oxy values and deoxy values. Oxysoft offers a whole lot of possibilities in terms of analysis. For now, we're going to well, have a quick look at what's all possible. So I'll say analysis, calculate. I'll track one of the traces as a data source. We're not interested in the average. We're interested in the oxygen consumption, actually, so VO2. We could also have a look at min-max, average and min-max, compare, correlate, regress. But for now, oxygen consumption, start time and end time. So I pick a time, well, which is clearly visible during the occlusion. So let's say 225 up to 235, 225, 235. Type of data, not interested in the select trace, interested in all open graphs. Now you can see that but the button calculate lights up, we can press it. 
see what happens. And this is actually the data that we just acquired. For every channel, we have the oxygen consumption visible. So this is oxyhemoglobin change in micromolars per second. For receiver one firing to transmitter one, we see that this is 0.11. For receiver one firing to, uh, sorry, transmitter one firing to receiver one, transmitter two firing to receiver one, 0.16. Changes 0.15, 18, 14, 0.8, 0 0.12, 0 0.15 micromolars per second. Uh, as promised, slight differences in value, meaning that there's heterogeneous oxygen consumption throughout, well, my lower arm in this case. I think we're not going to dive much further into OxySoft. I think this will also wrap up the, the talk as I prepared it. So uh, thank you all for your uh, attention. If there's uh, any questions,